Welcome to the journey home. I would say one of the most common things amongst all of the Christian traditions, at least at some point in the history of a Christian tradition, is the search for an intimate relationship with Jesus. And I would say that in all the years of my involvement in, in pastoral ministry, youth ministry, and the work with the Coming Home Network, and then now with this great experience of being able to be involved here with the Journey Home and EWTN, one of the most common themes we hear from people, sometimes not in these exact words, but is a desire for a real relationship with Jesus. And there's lots of counterfeits out there. There's lots of people that talk the good talk about having a personal relationship with Jesus. But I do know in my years that I've found many people that talk the talk about a personal relationship with Jesus, yet, yet they keep searching. Because it isn't just there. And how do I know that my experience of Christ is true? And how do I find the rock-solid foundation for that real fellowship with Christ that the Apostle John talks about in his first letter of John? A true fellowship with God, as well as one with another. Well, I suppose that's the theme for tonight's program, is search for an intimacy with Christ. And my guest this evening, Father Richard Delzingaro, who is now a Barnabite priest, is going to share with us his journey in the search for an intimacy with Christ. His search began with a, a Baptist and a Quaker and a Church of Christ background. I'll tell you about that in a moment. But the thread through this comes back to a, a, a statement by, that Paul made in his first letter to Corinthians. In chapter 2, Paul says... First of all, he says, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God in holy words or wisdom. <clears throat> in lofty words or wisdom, excuse me. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Think of all the things people talk about in the faith, but at the core of it is knowing Jesus and Him crucified. That's the theme for tonight's program. Remember, you're an important part of this program, so you can start calling us now with your questions at 1-800-221-9460, or you can send us an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Father Richard, welcome to the Journey Home. Thank you, Marcus. <clears throat> and uh, I want to have you make sure you send a greeting to your provincial, because I guess he's a... <laughs> He's an avid fan of yours. Well, uh, of the and program. I'm an avid fan of the program, exactly right. And so greetings to my father provincial, Father Julio, and to my confers at the Shrine and in Bethlehem, who I know are watching. <laughs> and are going to critique me tomorrow <laughs> when I get home. <laughs> All right. Well, let's give them something to critique here. Why don't we begin as we do every week, Father, and we invite you to give us your spiritual background. Well, it's a convoluted one but it's a Christian one. Uh -huh. It began um, being a, the product of a mixed marriage. My dad was Catholic, but not a practicing Catholic, sort of a nominal Catholic. My mother was Baptist. She would have raised us Catholic if this had been my father's wish, but he left the responsibility of our upbringing for religious matters to, up to my mother. And so we were raised as Baptists, my two brothers and I. And we were very active in the Baptist church. And my mother, to this day, who will not be watching the show because she doesn't get the cable station there, but we'll tape it for her, I hope. Uh, she, she's still a card-carrying Baptist, and she was a very spiritual person then and now, and uh, encouraged me to be religious. And um, I journeyed through the Baptist church up into my teen years, and then I became very caught up in the peace and justice issues of the Christian faith and turned my attention to the Society of Friends. And so for 14 years, I was a Quaker, a conscientious Quaker. I worked very hard at it. It was even a conscientious objective. Still have my original card stating that. But there was something missing. I wasn't, I wasn't getting the nourishment spiritually that I, that I sought. And so I started to go to this church and that church speaking. Thought about the Catholic Church because of my father's background and wound up uh, becoming ordained in a small independent church that I was attending called the Fellowship Church of Christ. And although I was not a pastor per se, I was, I was very active in ministry 
to the people of God, because at this time I was doing some graduate work in religion, always moving toward and wanting to know more about my faith. <clears throat> Feeling your calling was in the teaching realm? At this well, I, th I was a teacher. Okay. I taught for 30 years on the second career vocation uh, in the Catholic Church. I was a Barnabite. Um, yes, I felt I wanted to I wanted to learn more, not only because I wanted to use it as a device in my teaching, but also I just felt a need to understand more where Jesus was being revealed to us and how the love of God was being communicated and communicated to us. If you look back mm -hmm. on that time, our theme being the search for the intimacy of Jesus, would that be a good way of describing those years? Yes, very definitely. Because, as we all know, within, in the Protestant tradition, Jesus is very central and very important. And so I was nourished in that regard. But I kept coming back, as I look back in retrospect, I kept coming back to the image of Jesus as the crucified one. And that wasn't being nourished in my Protestant tradition. It wasn't being ignored. It just wasn't being nourished. As I look back now, at the time, I don't think I fully realized that. The, and so I started to move toward Catholicism, largely through the personal witness of my Catholic friends. No one ever tried to convert me to Catholicism, but they, they were Catholic. And I was so impressed with their, with their loyalty and their faith to what they had been trained to believe as cradle Catholics. And these people were not, were not um, converts. They were cradle Catholics. I know converts can sometimes be much more conscientious about their faith, but these people, these people were truly authentic. Mm -hmm. But they never said, oh, well, this is the one true church, join our church. When I was working on the second part of my graduate program, I, there was a watershed mark in my life. I met a friend. He was he come up from Catholic U. He was a priest, still a priest in the diocese of Pittsburgh, a teacher, and so we had this common background. And Bill was just a very beautiful and special person. Not only because he was committed to his priesthood, but he was committed to his faith and just to his interaction with people. He was a people person. And we were at Princeton one summer, and he invited me to uh, join him at Eucharist. And no one had ever done this before. I mean, I, I felt very welcome. Uh, he didn't say why he was doing it. He didn't say what was going to be going on. There was no agenda that I could perceive. And it really turned me on to the fact that to watch him say Mass, that intimate connectivity with Jesus in the Eucharist, I said, you know, I think I need to find out more about what it means to say the real presence mm -hmm. and to really feel that I was one with Jesus in that, in that particular moment. And so he said nothing more. I didn't see him again for a long time, but he, I, I, I thought, never left me. And so when I called him years later, after we had visited in between for various reasons, and, and told him that I was going to enter the Catholic Church. I said, are you sitting down because you're better? You're right, fall down. He said he wasn't surprised at all. He saw it coming. Mm -hmm. Now, people saw this long before I did, but it's, it's not that Protestantism was doing anything wrong. It's that Catholicism was bringing me to a point where I was truly appreciating Jesus and what Paul was talking about when he talked about Jesus as the crucified one. And it was linked so close to the resurrection that I began to see the theology working for me. At that point, up to that point, I had no real understanding up here of what was going on down here. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't so much that you were encountering particular problems in your Protestant background. Right. It was more the fullness of the Catholic faith right. that was drawing in that direction. Exactly. I'm curious, in that, <clears throat> so your journey into the Catholic Church after you met the, the priest that became a, the friend, it was an immediate change. It was gradual. There was gradual time in that. Um, what about the, the, there was certainly some doctrinal differences, though, between your, your Quaker background, uh, 
Did those cause a roadblock in your journey? In a way, yes, because to be perfectly honest with you, and even now I sometimes say to myself, I'm not sure I'm ready to be a Catholic. I don't know that I understand the faith, <laughs> that I really have a knowledge, because I was only Catholic a short time before I felt strongly the call to say, yes, Lord, I choose to have a vocation in your name. I choose to enter religious life. It happened quickly. It was, you know, uh, Francis Thompson says it in The Hound of Heaven. Uh, deliberate speed, majestic instancy. And if I try to sort it all out, it's not going to fall into any kind of scenario. But it was not a, a road to Damascus getting struck down from a horse experience. It was not It was not a rejection of the past because I'd like to make a point that the Apostle Paul, whom I see as, as, a, as a great inspiration, was not someone who rejected Judaism. He saw his faith in the risen Christ who had been crucified for each one of us as a continuation and indeed a fulfillment of the promise that had been made to his Hebrew ancestors. And so he never denies his Jewish background. So I don't look I don't look at my my journey my journey home to the Catholic faith as as a rejection of the past. I had to make that very clear to my mother because she said, what did I do wrong? I said, nothing, Mom. You did everything right. You never taught me to dislike people who were different than I am. You never taught me to be prejudiced against other religions. And so I said, if anything, you did it right. Now, this is where I think God is calling me. And, and I said, and you're part of this because my spirituality began with you. So it's very important to recognize that I'm not making an apology or trying to defend where I am now as opposed to where I was then. I don't choose it as a polemic, to use it as, a, as an arguing device that you're wrong and I'm right. This is where we are. It's, in, in a sense, I've, I've always made that emphasis, even with my guests, when we prepare for the Junior program, because uh, the majority of the guests that we've had are converts to the church who found Jesus before they were Catholics. They were great, very indebted. But yet, there is this drawing to this church that Christ founded in his apostles. And there is the, uh, there is the fullness of the church that we want to emphasize on the program, which is so important. But yet, we also recognize, right, that God Absolutely. is a part of our life all along and puts us off through these experiences to open our hearts to a, a, a deeper reality. So your, your time in, in the Quaker faith had certain aspects of it, I'm sure, that opened you up to certain aspects of Catholic theology Absolutely. in the UK because of the connection there. And the, the whole idea of looking for the light of Christ, looking for that which connected me to God. I've always, I think I've always been a religious person. I think, I, I think I've, I've always been a Christian. I cannot imagine my life without Christ, and I cannot imagine my life without Christ in a very intimate, interpersonal connection. It started with my mother telling me Bible stories as a child. I still have in my room today the Solomon's head of Christ that my parents have hanging in their living room that just traveled right along with me through all the changes. My mother gave me this picture. She said, I would like you to have this. I know it will mean the most to you. And I look at that picture and I say, Jesus, I've looked at you as a Baptist. I've looked at you as a Quaker. I looked, I've looked at you as an independent. And now I'm looking at you as a, as, as a Catholic. It's still me, Jesus, and for sure it's still you. <laughs> and so, you know, I, if someone walks by my room, they think, who is he talking to now? Well, there it is. I'm, I, that, to me, is, is where the relationship is. And that got nourished in my Catholic faith, in the period of instructions, in my practice of my, of my faith, and my appreciation of the tradition that's been handed down to us, because it's the central factor. But it's not something cold and aloof that's in some kind of a, a book. Even in the Bible, if you just read the Bible and it's the Word, that's not really meaning anything. Or if I take a passage here or a passage here or a passage here and try to put it all together and say, this is why I'm asking you to come to me, no, that, that one would not be enough for me. It's not, it's not isolated things. 
It's the integrated whole where the Word and the real presence come together in the sacrament. I remember you mentioned earlier when we were talking how, uh, as a child, you, you would see Catholic. So there was, there was this lure a little bit of, of Absolutely. The, talk about that and how that has been uh, brought to fruition in becoming a Catholic now in relation to this intimacy with Christ. Sure, sure. I grew up in a neighborhood that was um, practically entirely Catholic. Okay? The, the people who had come just one generation before from Calabria, so they were very connected to their faith and to the various holidays. And I was just very enthralled and interested in, would be a good word as a child, uh, in the processions, in, in the reverence. I used to go with my friends to, to, uh, to church on Saturday and they would hear confessions and they would, they would sit and have me kneel in church. And my mother never once said, you cannot continue to do this. She never said, you know, you're going to become Catholic. No, it was just, it was just allowable. And I was very, very taken by this, by this strong connection to the faith that incidentally, uh, Marcus, has been nurtured by the shrine because a lot of these same kinds of people came to the shrine and when I would see these processions at the shrine, it would be like a deja vu of what I grew up with as a child. And that, never le that, 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 that memory never left me, although I never processed it at the time, as a, as, a, as a journey movement, as a movement in the journey toward my, toward my entrance into the church. Now, as a Catholic, talk about, uh, from a Catholic perspective, uh, aspects of our Catholic faith, the fullness of the Catholic faith, that, that help you have an intimate relationship with Jesus. Because we hear Protestants often challenging Catholics, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Catholics say, yes, I do, of course I do. Talk about that from a Catholic perspective. Well, from, from my Catholic perspective, which I, and I think it would be shared by others, it definitely comes from the sacramental life. It definitely comes from, from the life of prayer. But there's a psychological dynamic going on in which in which Jesus is a person at the other end of the relationship. He is God with us. He is there for us. And it's, it's, I just cannot imagine, I cannot imagine my life without Jesus, and I cannot imagine my life now, at least presently where I am, without Jesus as I experience him in the sacraments. It's true that as a priest, the Eucharist, celebrating Mass, hearing a confession, celebrating reconciliation, the sacrament of the sick are very powerful moments. That, that's, that's where I'm finding Jesus. And then if I can get beyond the God talk with people and be with them, for example, if I'm doing the sacrament of the sick in a hospital room, I always involve the family because I say Jesus has called us all to be here present. And so that has come as a result of my, of my, my being Catholic. I can't say that it could not have happened when I was a Protestant. All that I can tell you is it, was, it didn't happen to me. And even though Jesus is very present in the Word, even though the Word connects with the sacrament, even when I preach, people would say to me, gee, you can really tell you were a Protestant, you preach like one, because I always start with the Word, and how Jesus will jump out at you in the Word, and then reinforce that in the sacrament. Mm -hmm. And so, that to me is nourished by my, by my Catholic faith. <clears throat> Talk a bit about your religious life, your call to uh, being a religious priest, and the Barnabites, and how that connects with the search for the intimacy with Jesus. I didn't tell you this before the show because I didn't think of it, but um, this will really amuse my confidence. I actually thought I was put on this planet to be a Franciscan. <laughs> I've always loved St. Francis. I've always loved animals. I was very much uh, enamored of his whole life and his faith and what he was able to do. But it didn't work out that way. And so when I d decided to discern a religious vocation to say yes, because the hound of heaven was still pursuing me, I thought, well, here we are, Lord, now where do I go? And I went through a book and I started to read, and the, the first group that came to my attention under the, under the letter B were the Barnabites. And there was that Paul connection. They are, they are clerics, regular of St. Paul. 
So I thought, well, they're an Italian congregation, and I'm an American, and I think if I joined the Barnabites, it would be mean that God has some kind of sense of humor. <laughs> um, but I thought, well, I have to pursue this. I kept being drawn to this, to this um, Pauline tradition that our founder established back in the 1500s when he was forming the community. And so I discerned, and I joined the community in Bethlehem, and 12 years later, here I am, warts and all, uh, a Barnabite. And I'm, and I'm very pleased, and I feel very vindicated, that in that 12 years, I've seen the Order make a conscious attempt to go back to the, our Pauline roots and our charism. Talk about the Pauline roots. Artists may not know what you mean by that. All right. Uh, our founder, Anthony Zachariah, was a doctor who became a priest who was very much captivated by the letters of Paul. And he, his, his philosophy, this is now the time of the Reformation and the Counter Reformation, was not to go out and beat the streets to bring people back to the faith just, just through proselytizing, but to do it through interior conversion. But, and he, he did it in such a way that he said, you have to be like a madman. You have to be crazy and run toward Jesus as though you are a madman running toward the truth. No one may understand you, but do not let that deter you. And he was absolutely committed to the idea of the cross as the crucified one and how that connected with Jesus as the Eucharistic Lord. And so this is a, through personal example, through commitment, through writing to his confreres, through his sermons, he said, Paul crucified. Actually, the original, original name of our congregation was uh, Paul decapitated. The idea that suffering is not a morbid pastime, but is something which draws us into intimate communion with Jesus as both human and divine, as one with God. And so this whole idea of conversion through example, preaching the Word from the Word, but then illustrating it from example, and then a very intimate uh, spiritual attachment to the Blessed Sacrament. That would be our Pauline roots. That would be our Pauline charism. Would you say that that priest friend, Bill, that you had, would you a good model of this kind of evangelization? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because he was very scripturally oriented. The Word was very important. He taught Bible. He was studying the languages as I was. And then it was through the, the personal example of, of believing what he believed without approaching it from a doctrinaire point of view. This is why we're Catholic and this is why they aren't Catholic. Never, never did I have that impression. And it was more to be, to be all things to all men. And then the, 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 the bottom line is, well, the one that I always come back to is the, is, is the verse from Philippians. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. In other words, living in Christ is about as good as it's going to get in this life. But dying with Christ is the better prize for which our citizenship in heaven awaits us. And so I think the Barnabites have pretty much lived up to that kind of charism. Our, our founder was a visionary, but he was not an ideologue. You will not find, you will not find a systematic theology in his writings. He didn't live long enough. But he certainly was able to draw men and women and lay people to his to his absolute devotion to God and to what God has done for us by, through love, for love, in the cross. And a call mm. in, for an internal conversion, right? That was his, his answer to From the within, goal. right, exactly right, from within the church. Let's not go out and, and stormtroop the uh, trenches to, to, uh, to counteract. Let's start where we are and have people recognize the, the, through interior conversion, through example, through prayer, the beauty of their faith. Let's say that uh, one of the viewers uh, would like a deeper relationship with Jesus. You know, they hear people talk about the personal relationship, the intimacy, and they've tried 
all kinds of things. Uh, any practical advice for folks? Most people are intimidated by, by the word intimacy. For, for them, intimacy has to have some kind of sexual connotation. And intimacy does not have to have that connotation for, as, as far as a relationship with Christ is concerned. I would say that through prayer, through, through a continual draw, being drawn to the Christ-like message of love of God, love of neighbor, doing unto others as you would have them do unto you, not being afraid to share. I have not, I have not hesitated from the pulpit to say to people, I absolutely hope I can convey to you the message that I am in love with the Son of God. Mm -hmm. And if I talk about the Trinity, if I talk about God the Creator, God who is the, 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 uh, the Father of the Son, who is His beloved, love is the galvanizing force, I say, I can participate in all of that. So I think, I think it just, you can't force the issue because, because I know that God talk can really put people off. But I think you really need to just let them know how you believe. If you exert some kind of energy or enthusiasm, even if people disagree with you, they still may feel, gee, because maybe he has something, maybe there's something there, maybe he has something to say. And I haven't once spelled out a doctrine. I haven't once defined a dogma. I have said, I find Jesus present in the Word as it is revealed to me in Scripture and in the sacraments as it is revealed to me through participation in these various actions which, which are grace abounding. I don't have the answers and I would not presume that I have them. I can only tell you where my personal story is coming from. It has not been easy journeying toward Catholicism. It hasn't been easy to be a Catholic. But I have a very good role model here and an example in that Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. So if you share those things with people, the kind of simplicity and courage, I'm hoping, I'm praying, I'm believing that they will follow, they will see some kind of intimacy. Before we take a break, Father, how about word of encouragement for our need for vocations. Uh, you, you were a second career vocation, right? That's exactly right. A later vocation. Right. I ended at the age of 50. My one encouragement is it's never too late. <laughs> Winston Churchill did his greatest things in history after the age of 50. And I always compare myself, and that's, um, it's probably against humility, but George Frederick Handel wrote the Messiah after he was 50. <laughs> and we remember him for that. Now, I don't want to put myself in, that, in such great company that I'm saying that I'm in with the big-time players, but I would say that if the call is there, you may ignore it as much as you want. If God wants you and needs you, which is the better part of it, He needs you, then God is going to call you. Mm -hmm. And then you just from there you take the prayer of perseverance and you ask Jesus to be with you in the journey. I'm happy to say that that's been my my experience. I'm going to leave you, don't forsake you, he said. Right? Exactly. That's been fulfilled in your life. I, I would I would I would say yes to the to the maximum limit. <laughs> that that to be in Christ is to is to have it all. all right, thank you, Father. Let's take a break. Back in just a moment with your questions for Father Richard, and uh, in, in his search and finding of the intimacy of Jesus. My guest this evening, Father Richard, is uh, been talking about his journey of faith, uh, Baptist, Quaker, Church of Christ. Was, was there, is there, as you look at that journey from Baptist to Quaker to Church of Christ to Catholic, was there a, 
a thread that made makes sense as you look back on that journey of why that order of things for your particular life? I think so. I would say that it's at the, the centerpiece of all of it was to find Jesus in an authentic relationship. Not that the others were inauthentic. I don't want to say that. But there was there was the, the desire to need to need something more, uh, and the desire to to be more in relationship to Jesus as I experience Him now in the real presence. Okay. All right. Let's take our first caller. This is uh, Marie from Kentucky. Hello, Marie. What's your question for us? Hi, Marcus, and hi, Father. Uh, my question is concerning the writings of uh, Thomas Aquinas concerning the different degrees of seeing God. And um, frankly, those writings leave me a little bit cold because I always understood heaven as being with Jesus, you know, physically seeing Jesus and being with the human God-man, Jesus. And so my question is, how, is how does this relate to being intimate with Jesus? And how can I understand these writings? Because the whole idea of seeing God, I think he's talking about an interior seeing, but I'm not really... Sure. So I was wondering if maybe you guys could clarify that for me. Thank you, Marie. Good question. Father? Wow. It's a long time. I've finished time. I, I applaud you for, for your willingness and your uh, perseverance in staying with Thomas Aquinas. It certainly is a worthwhile experience. Um, I would say that stay with, stay with the task if you feel drawn to it. And I think the final analysis of your reading will be that Thomas will show you what it is to, to be with God and to see God in Christ. And I believe that will be the intimacy that, you would, that, you will, that you're seeking now that will be fulfilled in this whole intellectual theological search that you're on. And give yourself a break. Thomas Aquinas is not easy reading. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there, there, are, there are many people, myself included, for whom there are still many questions. I'm making a list uh, of questions that I want to appeal to the Holy Spirit. Should I ever get into heaven as easily as I hoped that I would get into heaven? <laughs> and and one of, that might be one of the good questions you could ask at that point in time. How, and, uh, how can I be intimate with God? Um, here and now through a knowledge of Christ. Yeah. You know, that's, to me, that's why we do need the church to help us discern good teachers from bad mm -hmm. teachers. Because there's mess of books out there that try to answer that question, but they've lost their bearings mm -hmm. and, and can get people off on the wrong track. You know, you're supposed to go to Boston. You end up in, in the, you know, uh, or, you know Fairbanks, Alaska. Well, you, um, if you're supposed to go to Fairbanks, that's where you ought to be. But if you're supposed to be in Boston, you need the right guide. And that's why we have the church. And the church has said that Thomas Aquinas is one good teacher. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's the one that the church has said, but he's not easy. So we do have others that help us understand Thomas. And um, before we go to the next caller or email, she did strike us something I find interesting, and that is the seeing mm -hmm. of God. And the spiritual writers do talk about that in the spiritual journey as we grow in our union with Christ, fellowship with Christ, that there's less of an emphasis on the physical senses and a journey to the spiritual right, senses. A higher, a higher level. Also, when you're, when you're talking about Thomas Aquinas, as I, as I encourage you to continue, Go read sometime the hymns of Thomas Aquinas, the beautiful Eucharistic hymns, and you're going to see where he connects with Jesus on an even higher level, I think, spiritually, than he does in, in, in the various summas that he has written and left us as, as, as a wonderful tradition in the church. Thank you, Father. Let's go to our first email. This is uh, Nick in Newton, Illinois. Dear Father Richard, did you ever have anyone try to keep you away from Catholicism? How did your friends take it when you decided to become Catholic? That's a very good question. And I have to say, in all honesty, no one ever said, 
oh, don't you become a Catholic, um, what, what happened would be that I would get, there would be no uh, affirmation or there would be no real support. So I suppose that would be a way of saying, no, don't, don't join the church. So you weren't in the, the circle where it was anti-Catholic? No, and that was I, did, I did not. I, I experienced that in my college years and in the 50s growing up, but I never, I never, I never um, experienced it in, in, in later life, in my professional life as a teacher and, 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 and in the, vari the various um, churches that I was, was drawn to, that I ever hear people to uh, bash the Catholic Church. Great. Let's take our next caller. Jeff in Minnesota, what's your question for tonight? Hello, Mr. Grodak. Hello, Jeff. Um, first off, I want to say I'm a cradle Catholic, and I think I've learned more about Catholicism from this show than from any other show that I've ever watched. So thank you. Thanks the guest. Good. And Father Richard, my question was, uh, I know that there's a lot of difference between Protestantism and Catholicism, especially in the Magisterium our belief in the Eucharist and the veneration of saints. Considering just the, uh, the fact that our Eucharist is worthy of worship and that Mary, especially Mary in the veneration of saints, plays such an important role, I was wondering if one of those were harder for you to uh, overcome on your, on your way to Catholicism. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, especially come from Baptist, Quaker, right. Church of Christ. What was harder, the Eucharist or Mary? That, that's a very good question. And I would say, Jeff, that um, understanding the richness of the, of the Catholic tradition, the teaching of the Eucharist, was, was a, a, a wonderful experience for me intellectually and then spiritually, of course. I, I did not truly, I have to be honest with you, uh, have a problem with, with the, the saints or with the Virgin Mary because my faith was grounded in the creed. And so Mary's role in the creed was important. So it just made sense to me that the church would see her role in salvation history and in the incarnation and its presence on earth to be important. And for years I recited, not as a Baptist, however, not as a Quaker, but from that point forward, I, I had memorized the creed. And so when we talked about the communion of saints, I took great comfort in knowing that there would be other people like me, human people, who were part of the, of the program that God had outlined for us in this great story of redemption. So that I did not, and I never was asked, you know, well, how can you accept this when it's not stated openly in the Bible? I never ran into those kinds of questions in my search. For what reason, I can't, I can't really give you. But they, are, they were not things I took for granted, but they were not roadblocks. I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say this. I think when you... For me, coming to Catholicism happened because I stopped asking so many questions <laughs> and just started to feel that something was happening inside of me and that no matter where I was, Baptist, Quaker, Independent, Catholic, Jesus was always central and, and very important. And where I am now, is for me a very good place. If I start asking myself this question or that question, or if I start wondering about this issue or that issue, those, that, that preoccupies me with the externals. And for me, there is only one core in my faith, God, and my belief in God, and what God has done for me through revelation, through faith in Christ. So I know that it's hard when these questions come up because we have this human need to know, and I have this human need to know, but I found the less I asked, the more I was able to believe, and then the understanding would come. You know, it's like Anselm says, faith leads to understanding. You believe, then you understand. 
rather than I have to understand in order to believe. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answer helps you, but that's how I came to the conclusion. Well, the core of that constant search, I've got to have the answers. Well, the core of pride in the midst yes. of the And it reminds me of that wonderful verse I love in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, where it says that we are to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding. Right, exactly right. Because there is that tension. Now, that's why in our search for the answers, thank God we have a church that Christ has given to us, that he said would be guided by the Spirit, that we can trust. In fact, it's one of the reasons that I came to understand that the beginning of the rosary mm -hmm. begins with the creed. It sets the boundaries, and it gets that out of the way. These are the doctrines that we're, now we're in the midst of the truth. Now we can relax and pray. You know, it sets the boundaries right. for us. If we spend our time still trying to figure out the boundaries, we might not get to pray right. as we should freely. And I don't have a hierarchy of, of saints, or I don't have a problem with, you know, where, where is Mary in relationship to my faith? Mary is where Mary is because this is how God have set, preordained that it should be. And Marcus brought up a very good point, and I don't think I'm even ashamed to say it uh, because it was a lesson I had to learn. It was a, a lot of pride kept me out of the church because I thought I had to know. I had to understand everything to make sure that what I was doing was right. And the only thing I really needed to understand was that which I already knew, that God loves me for who I am, and that's it. There are no qualifications for it. And so the other things, all of the externals, I call them, uh, will become clearer when it's the time for them to become clear. Let's take our next email. Jeff and Tammy uh, Munch from Mass City, Kansas. Dear Marcus, my wife was born and raised fundamentalist Baptist. Through study and prayer, she made the choice to join the Catholic Church. Unfortunately, her parents were devastated. Our relationship with her parents has been strained. We want to tell them that we understand their concern and would like to begin a dialogue with them in an effort to answer their questions. Is there a way to cross this great divide and find some common ground? <clears throat> yes, and it's not going to be easy. Um, probably first and foremost, you've got to remember the good words of the hymn. They will know we are Christians by our love. You have to love your parents and your family no matter what. You may not like what's going on. They sure don't like what's going on in your lives. But that, that cannot be, that should not be the occasion where you don't speak to one another and you allow, you allow each other to know that you truly love each other. When I became, when I announced to my mother on Palm Sunday, when she was visiting me that I was going to enter the Catholic Church, she said to me, I hope you're very happy. This was not what I intended for you, but you're free to choose. When I indicated that I was going into religious life, she, she absolutely could not understand where I was coming from. She thought I was having a nervous breakdown. <laughs> now, how was I able to get beyond that obstacle? Not by talking about it and saying, Mom, you've got to believe this, you've got to understand this. By but simply letting her know that I loved her and that she was a great parent and that I was, I was grateful for my father's support, but that really she was the pivotal person in my, in my spirituality. And that's probably what you're going to have to do in your family situation. And there's absolutely no guarantee that you are going to be successful in the beginning. You may never have to go there with the conversation. You may just have to avoid it. But you don't have to avoid believing it, and you don't have to give up. I deal with a parishioner who was a Jehovah's Witness, and his parents absolutely, in the beginning, would not speak to him. But now, the, the relationship is better, and I feel it's better because he has assured them, no matter what faith he was, he still loved them very much. So sometimes the words are our worst enemy. It's the feelings and the body language and the attitude that we communicate. Let's, let's take our next caller, Bill from Maryland. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Oh, hi, Marcus. Uh, hi, Father Richard. Um, I've always prayed to the Father, and I've never had a 
relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus, is, is it required that I have that? Thank you for your question. These are very good questions, Marcus. I know them. Going back to all my theology. <laughs> um, God the Father, that's an image that we have of God. For me, going to Scripture, and particularly in the fourth gospel, where you have this intimate language of Jesus and the Father, allowed me to, to realize the whole essence of what the Trinity is all about. And I won't go there with you because that's, that's, that's too theological a question to, to discuss here. But once again, I would have to go back to my, to my polling background because this, of the centrality of Jesus the Son in relationship to the Father. While we were still sinners, God, who loved us, sent forth the Son, born of a woman, born under the law, etc., etc., as he says in Galatians. So that I, can't, I personally could not say to you that it's wrong. I could possibly say to you, for example, if you would come to me for spiritual direction, or if you would ask me for a pastoral question, I might say you're not realizing the fullness of our relationship to God, Father, Son, and Spirit. But I definitely would not qualify you as being wrong in feeling this approachability, if I can use that word, to the Father, to God the Father. You know, we're assuming in this, of course, that this gentleman believes in Christ and believes in right. the Creator. We're not saying that, that right. you, can, you only have the Father and don't believe right. in the Son. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about this intimacy. Right. And, it, and a lot of that comes with the way you're brought up. And I know that um, I was brought up in my my spiritual tradition to have really more an emphasis on Jesus mm -hmm. and not so much the Father. So it's taken me even in the journey to feel more comfortable praying to the Father except in, in saying the Our Father just because of my tradition. I know that we're, we're called by Jesus himself to pray to the Father and most of the prayers of the church. That's a good point, Marcus, because and that's right, and I, I, I would have to be guilty of assuming that. But you're saying that an intimacy with God the Father is, is a wonderful thing to have because even, even Jesus referred to God as Abba, which was an intimate connectivity to the Father. Paul tells us that we are children by adoption, which allows us to call God Abba, Daddy, Father. And so in this regard, you are, you are right on target. You're not denying the presence of the others, the Son and the Spirit, in your relationship, but you are gravitating toward that which gives you a sense of spiritual connectivity. And I say right on. Um, we always end the program with this question because it brings us around to Jesus. It connects right with this question we just had here. How has, in your journey, becoming a Catholic brought you in a fuller, intimate relationship with Jesus? I can't answer that in sound bites. I can only say to you, Marcus, that my, an intimate relationship with Jesus begins with the cross and the crucified one. It doesn't end there, obviously. But it's the whole idea of God loving me so much, me individually, personally, to want to die for my sins on my behalf. And I think that the Catholic Church, I don't say that only the Catholic Church, but I say that, that that mentality of unworthiness and yet uniqueness and specialness in the calling is, is, is nurtured and reinforced by the presence of a crucifix in my life. And Jesus is the crucified Christ, the risen Lord. And that was very much a part of your calling to be a Barnabas. Exactly right. Father, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Would thank you, you for the invitation. We're going to take a break in a moment. Would you give the, uh, the people at home a blessing? Absolutely. <clears throat> Can't match I stand? No, no, just look at okay. the To all of you out there, thank you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the good Lord protect you from all evil and bring you to everlasting peace. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank Take you. a short break. We'll be back in a moment with some final words for the journey.
I remember when I was uh, a young minister. I was at my first Presbyterian church where I was a solo pastor. And I remember walking up into the pulpit for the first time and experienced something that many other ministers experienced because the either lay folk in their church had done the same thing for the pastor. But there in the pulpit, there was a little brass uh, plaque on the pulpit. And it said these simple words, a quote from Scripture. It said, we would see Jesus. That's a quote from Scripture where some Greeks come to Philip and say, we would see Jesus. Can you take us to Jesus? And they, the, the, the laity of that small Presbyterian church, at some point in their history, had put that plaque to remind the pastor that that's whom they are to see and to hear is Jesus. And that has always been a reminder to me of what our calling is as Catholics is to be very sensitive in the important relationships that we have. We've got to be careful. Yes, I believe that we are members of the one true, one holy Catholic and apostolic church. That's the truth. But in our expression of that, we are called to be loving and gentle and, and sensitive. And the most important thing when we proclaim the faith to our family and to our friends and to our neighbors and those we work with, is that in our words and in our actions, they are to see Jesus. And that should be our prayer. Lord, today, help me by your grace so that in every word and every action, those in my life will see you. They'll see beyond me and see you. And let's keep that in prayer for one another so those in our life who are walking with us on the journey, we'll see Jesus. God bless. See you next week.